Hey gang, so Game of Thrones is in its final season now, and like most of the nerds out there, I'm all about it. And I thought this might be an excellent opportunity to go back and check out that one moment when uh, my profession of choice, fire dancing, wound up in Game of Thrones. That's right, all the way back in Season 4, Episode 2, that is The Purple Wedding, uh, we got to see fire dancing on display, and the flow arts in general, in an episode of Game of Thrones. So, as a professional who has been in this industry for 12 years, uh, I wanted to go back and check it out and comment both on kind of like the historical accuracy of including fire dancing in flow arts, as well as kind of commenting on the performance elements of it too. Drex here from DrexFactory.com and today our topic is all about the flow arts and Game of Thrones, two of my very favorite things, so it works out quite well. And of course before we dive in, I just want to put out a massive thank you to the friends of the channel. Big thanks to Dark Monk. Flow Toys, LMF Props, Spinballs, and Ultrapoy for helping to make the videos on this channel possible. You can learn more about all of these awesome companies by following the links that I've got down in the description of this video. Cool, so it is time to crawl back in time all the way to the venerable season four. That's right, halfway through Game of Thrones when Prince Joffrey was marrying Marjorie and there was a massive to-do about their wedding. Now, I was actually really excited for this season because even in the trailer for this season, you could see a shot in which very clearly there was somebody who was spinning what looked like poi at the time, but I'm now pretty sure it was clubs. And that, of course, made me go, yay, that's my thing. So I'm going to go ahead and watch through that part of the episode with you guys and add in my own little commentary and everything so we can see how uh, the producers and the showmakers did and everything. Uh, I'm going to pick this up right after Tywin and Lady Oleana have had their conversation about debts in the Iron Bank. So let's check it out. So first up, stilts and fire juggler. Awesome. We've got a fire hula hooper as well, and I can see a couple different performers in here, woo, fire breathing, that are uh, spinning what could be poi, but I think are actually more likely clubs. So let's stop right here and just chat for a second about the historicity of, of all this uh, right quick. So it's actually an interesting choice to me that um, they did use clubs instead of poi here because we actually do have a historical precedent for spinning clubs in a way that we normally think of modern day poi as being spun. Um, historically, they were called either meals or less politically correctly, Indian clubs. Um, and most of the poi tricks that we're used to seeing, actually clubs kind of worked through a lot of that vocabulary. Ironically enough, um, there's probably more of the vocabulary of club swinging that we would recognize as poi spinning than we might even recognize with traditional uh, Maori poi spinning. Um, so that actually is a really interesting choice and I kind of dig that they, that they made that choice because certainly putting poi spinning in a medieval context is very anachronistic. Now that said, putting club swinging in this context is also a bit anachronistic, but I appreciate that at least they're trying a little bit there. Of course, putting poi spinning itself in any scene that is, you know, even supposed to be set in medieval times and everything is definitely a huge anachronism because uh, clearly poi spinning would be half a world away and there's basically no chance whatsoever that these quasi-European peoples would be aware of such a thing. Granted, we are dealing with a fictional world here, um, but at the same time, there, there are certain things that definitely jump out as being a little bit too anachronistic, and one of the biggest ones is the use of fire here. Now, I know a lot of us associate fire with kind of like tribalism and primitivism and everything, and I can see why. You know, we definitely feel very far removed from fire in a modern context. And thinking about fire, we're thinking about, you know, people that lived in less industrialized societies and everything and had more of a direct connection to it. The thing is, is that all of the materials necessary to spin fire are products of the industrial age and really don't appear until the late 20th century. So, for example, uh, the wicking that we use on all of our fire props is made of Kevlar. This is a uh, synthetic uh, polymer-based fabric that doesn't come into existence until the late 20th century. Um, and, you know, granted, there was a period of fire dancing before the introduction of Kevlar where they were using asbestos for their wicks instead. Oh, God. Um, and 
you know, maybe you can make an argument that these guys would be using asbestos for their wicks and everything. Okay, I could let's let's stretch our uh, suspension of disbelief there. I can buy that, I guess. Um, the other piece, though, that is a harder part of that puzzle is the fuel that they're using. Um, so white gas, which is the usual fuel that we use for fire dancing in a modern context, sometimes we use lamp oil and. I really, really hope that the fire breather that they had in this scene was using uh, lamp oil themselves. But um, both white gas and lamp oil are refined derivatives of petroleum. And they're refined derivatives that we only get in the industrial age. In fact, I, I can't imagine how you would possibly get those derivatives in a more medieval context, at least not with an obscene amount of work and uh, probably more so than you know, street performers would really uh, be able to muster. But uh, this is one of those cases where, uh, you know, yes, you know, again, in many movies and TV shows that are set in medieval times and everything, you see them using things like pitch to burn on torches and everything. And again, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a thing. I'm, it, it definitely happened. But Pitch has this really interesting consistency where it's like super thick. It's, it's almost like molasses. And when it burns, it gets a little bit more liquidy and everything. So basically anybody who was burning pitch on a prop wouldn't be able to move it around very fast because they basically would just be throwing around napalm with themselves as they were doing so. Um, not exactly the greatest way to celebrate a wedding, unfortunately. So from a historical context, at least, I'm going to give the club swinging kind of a maybe-ish, uh, whereas literally everything involving fire in this episode is completely out of the question, not historical at all. So one thing I did want to highlight real quick is there's a blink and you'll miss it moment where Bronn and Tyrion and Podrick are all walking into the wedding and everything. And behind them, there is a performer who is a club swinger who's doing two moves that beginner poi spinners will almost certainly recognize. The three beat weave, which I've done a tutorial for that I will link up in the cards and everything, and a, uh, a corkscrew which I will also link to up in the cards and uh, down in the description and everything. I've done a tutorial for that move as well. Um, and part of what I like about this, number one is it's, it's something that, you know, basic poi spinners are definitely going to recognize. In fact, all poi spinners are probably going to recognize. But um, there's a really interesting moment that happens as uh, our trio is walking in front of the camera, which is that the performer who is spinning clubs and everything switches from doing that three beat weave to doing a corkscrew up around their head. Um, I don't know whether perhaps the uh, director of photography or the director of the episode gave the performer the note that they were going to need to change levels to stay visible, or the performer just kind of like intuited that from the way the camera was moving. But it's a really great choice because it keeps the performer on camera for just a few seconds longer. You're still aware of them back there. Um, so I don't know whose idea that was, but whosever idea that was, it was a really good one. So jumping forward about a minute, we have another kind of panning shot that uh, we have a club spinner who's spinning fire in the background as we pass by this contortionist. Cool. As well as a juggler and a, another fire hula hoop artist in the background. Now as we actually enter into the feast itself, we see another club swinger who's doing basic poi tricks. This time it looks like on fire as we pan around. And what I like about this is that this is actually the shot that I saw in the trailer that kind of cued me into, oh my god, flow arts are going to show up in the season of Game of Thrones. Um, and interestingly, I'm going to bookmark this because I'm not entirely sure that I'm right about this, but um, it looks like the build and movements of this person who is spinning fire as we pan past Joffrey are pretty close to the build and movements of that person that we panned uh, past just a second ago as we were doing that nice little shot across the fountain that wound up with the with the fire hula hooper and everything. So I'm I'm actually curious if that is actually the same performer that they just moved to a different location and everything, which, you know, again, makes sense from a production standpoint because you're not paying an extra performer and everything. And uh, also uh, kind of a cool choice because it makes it feel like the wedding is inhabited by more performers than it might be. 
or maybe they are separate performers and I'm reading too much into it. So really obvious question here. Thus far, all of the club swingers that we've seen here are doing really, really, really simple tricks. Like we never see anybody who's playing around with flowers or hybrids or anything like that. So um, these would be more advanced poi tricks that a lot of people in the poi world would certainly think of as being their go-tos for creating a performance around. So why don't we see them here? Um, and the short answer is that there's kind of a gap between what we in the flow arts world see as being those tricks that are worthwhile and those tricks that the muggle audience, that is people who have no idea what's going on in the fire dancing world, are taking a look at and are interested in, right? Um, and it tends to be that more often than not, the stuff that photographs really well and the stuff that integrates really well into busy scenes like this is the really simple stuff. It's the stuff that most of us learn within the first couple months or year of spinning. You know, all the moves that I've seen thus far, just simple reels, a three beat weave, a corkscrew and everything, or not a corkscrew, but a windmill. Um, these are all tricks that you learn within that first year, if not the first couple months and everything. So is it still worthwhile to learn all the complicated stuff? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a great challenge for your brain. It's a great challenge for your body and everything. But when it comes time to do the thing that is going to come off better for performances and everything, nine times out of 10, you actually want to dial it back. And this is a great example of that, you know? These people are not on camera for any more than like a fraction of a second. And they just make the most of it that they possibly can with stuff that they know the audience is gonna glom onto, you know? Three beat weave may be kind of simple, but on camera it looks really cool and it looks like something that can grab your attention. So the only other time in the episode that we see any flow arts or fire dancing is when we go forward to about the 40 minute mark and there's kind of a blink and you'll miss it moment where this guy who is not having any luck with his juggling has another fire hula hooper behind him. Um, and I wanted to grab onto this moment just for a second to make a couple comments about hula hooping in general. We've already talked about how um, the fire element of this is very, very clearly anachronistic. Um, but the other part of this that's kind of interesting is the hooping element to it. Um, we usually, what we think of as modern hula hooping is definitely something that dates from about like the 1950s or so. Um, and it comes from, you know, a plastic hoop that was made by, I think it was the Whammo Toy Company and everything that they marketed under the name the hula hoop because the movement that it took with your hips to keep it up looked to them like hula dancing from Hawaii. Now that doesn't mean that people in Hawaii ever danced with hoops around their waist. It's just that to them, it looked like it was the same kind of thing. Um, so is there a precedent for having a hoop around your waist in kind of a medieval context? Um, and the short answer is maybe. So we see hoops showing up very, very early on in human history. Like literally as soon as people are writing, we see records of people using hoops to play. Um, the first record of which shows up in a painting on a wall in an Egyptian tomb. Uh, we know at the very least that the Egyptians were using hoops in the same way that a lot of people in history have used hoops, something called hoop bowling, where you use a stick to keep a hoop rolling uh, as, as you're moving along and everything. Um, we also have some classical sources that say that you know, keeping a hoop aloft uh, around your waist and everything is something that both the Egyptians and Greeks did in antiquity. So is there any chance that somebody in medieval Europe might be doing it? Maybe. At the very least, we can say that uh, hoop bowling, that is rolling it along with a stick, almost certainly would have been something that it existed at the time frame-ish that we kind of imagine Game of Thrones to be in everything. Um, but around the waist, I don't know. That, that's, that's kind of an open question, and I, I, don't, I, I haven't done enough research to know if uh, keeping it up around the waist would have been a thing in this era. But um, I'm going to label it as plausible, at least, because we know that people played with hoops at that time, and we know that people thousands of years before were uh, spinning hoops around their waists. So that's a solid maybe. So here's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. When you're talking about any kind of fantasy literature or entertainment, you're talking about what is basically an imagined and kind of idealized version of the past. And certainly one of the reasons why we, including me, love Game of Thrones is that there are actual historical events that wind up being points of inspiration for the plot points and everything. 
That said, clearly nothing that happens in Game of Thrones actually happened in real life. Um, and so when we construct fantasy worlds, what we're really doing is we're kind of deliberately creating an, an, a, a, an anachronistic construction. Um, Tolkien understood this uh, very, very deeply. He knew that the world that he was creating in Lord of the Rings is one that never truly existed, that he was taking a lot of different pieces that existed at different points in European history and kind of mashing them up into something that was altogether new and original. Um, and Game of Thrones is no different. So it becomes one of those things that you kind of have to split the difference between inhabiting this uh, world that is very clearly imaginary while also kind of like holding them accountable for what could and could not theoretically exist in the context of that. So when it comes to things like, you know, people juggling and spinning clubs or hula hooping and everything, you know, yeah, that you, you can make that suspension of disbelief. The fire thing, though, I, there's just no way. There's, there's just no way that that's going to happen in a world with this kind of economy and technology and everything. So that's that's basically where I land on that. Your mileage may vary. So I hope you guys enjoyed going back and watching this old Game of Thrones episode with me and uh, kind of taking it apart from a flow arts and fire arts standpoint and everything. Um, let me know if you guys like this and if you would like to see more videos like this in the future of me checking out some other places where fire spinning and flow arts and circus appear in popular culture and kind of going through and picking apart like why did they make this choice or why did they make that choice? Uh, analyzing it and the like. Yeah, let me know down in the comments if this is a thing that you dig. In the meantime, I would just like to put a massive thank you out there to my awesome supporters on Patreon, because without them, this video and none of the videos on my channel would possibly exist. So thank you for all your support. And for those of you who are interested in signing up to support the work that I do, you can head on over to patreon.com slash drexfactorpoi, and thank you so much in advance. So what is your favorite episode of Game of Thrones? And more to the point, are you excited for the ending of it, or are you sad for the ending of it? Uh, me personally, I'm really curious to see how the story ends, but it is kind of bittersweet, right? Uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and check out the other videos on my channel. And uh, again, let me know if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future. Thanks so much for watching, and enjoy the flow. Peace.